All right. Uh, so now we're going to move on to next topic, which is the topic of branching processes. So a branching process is a specific kind of continuous time Markov chain, or, well, Markov chain could be continuous or discrete time. Um, and what we imagine happening is we start at time zero, where we start at time zero with a particle. And what that particle does is it evolves generation after generation by branching or splitting into uh, some random number of identical particles. Okay, so for maybe in the first generation, the particle splits into two. And now each of those particles is an identical copy of the original and can go and split maybe into three particles, maybe this one again branches into two particles, um, maybe again this one goes into four, and so on. Okay, and so there is some sequence of generations non-overlapping discrete time generations at which this particle which start we started with one particle and it has since branched and split into some random number of particles after time after generation t uh, so the the setting that you could think of is this could be a this could be an atom which after some period of time splits and then splits into two identical atoms and the evolution of the process after that point is an independent copy of the original process. Uh, this is this is a um, this is a property called self similarity that I'll, that will uh, will be taking advantage of. This is what gives these branching processes that we'll study the, a recursive or regenerative structure, the, which is similar to the structure we've been taking advantage of throughout the semester in renewal processes, and then most recently in, markup, in our study of Markov chain. Um, the, the original um, example that we, we're going to think about in, in this case is what's called a Galton-Watson process. And the Galton-Watson process so we'll call this a GW process. So the Galton-Watson process was originally a process for modeling the evolution or the genealogy of family names. So at some time t, there's an individual at generation t that has a family name and then has offspring, or particularly male offspring, uh, which passes that name along. And then those offspring have further offspring in the next generation, which pass pass the name along to and so on. And so the question is, so one of the questions there is if you are modeling this offspring distribution, uh, that, that if you model this as being uh, in the way that we describe that when you have offspring, they pass their name along to the next generation at the same, at independently and with the same distribution as the original, then the quest question becomes um, yeah. how many how many people or how many individuals are alive in generation N, some generation in the future, with this name? And, you know, another question is, what's the chance that the name eventually goes extinct? What's the chance that the name? Another, another application of this type of idea could very well be uh, in the spread of a disease where the disease starts with one individual at time zero. That individual passes the disease along to some other random number of people who pass it along to some random number of people, and so on and so forth. And then the question becomes, um, does the disease die out or does the disease go on forever and infect everybody in a population? That's not exactly what the Galton-Watson process was uh, originally designed to model, but similar idea is present in the study of disease spread. Okay. 
So in the Galton Watson process, we're going to write the random variable Zn to be the number of individuals at time t or at time n. We start at time zero with one individual. Um, and what we assume is that the number of individuals at time Zn is a sum over all of the individuals alive in the n minus first generation of some random variables x and j where x and 1, x and 2, etc. are i, i, d, i, i, d copies of Z1 according to some offspring distribution, which I'll write as PK. So this is called the offspring distribution. Okay. So just so what we have is we have one particle Z0. It's going to give rise to some random number of particles from the offspring distribution and then each one of these particles write it as say individual 1 1 individual 1 2 so first generation first particle second generation first generation second particle is going to give rise to some random number of offspring let's write it this way z01 so this is the first individual at generation zero. So Z01 is going to be the number of offspring of the initial individual. And then each of the individuals, the, these two individuals, one, one, and one, two, are going to give rise to, in the, to a number of offspring, Z11 and Z12. And then those offspring are gonna further have uh, off, further offspring according to the same distribution. And so, uh, by this description, Zn, which is the sizes of the generations uh, at each of these at each of the generations, this is a markup chain. On the positive integers, or the non-negative integers, including zero, um, with transition probabilities given by the probability that z n plus 1 equals k given z n equals m. So this is equal to the offspring distribution p k star m, which is the m-fold convolution of the offspring distribution. So this is, I'm writing this as the probability that x1 plus x m equals k for x1 through x m i i d from the offspring distribution. Okay. Uh, so the first thing that I want to that, I, that, that we should highlight here is that this has that this class of processes has what's called a self-similarity property and we're going to take advantage of that self-similarity property in analyzing the process which is to say that the lineage the lineage of each particle is an independent copy of the initial particle. So what that means is that when we 
start the process, the process actually starts at time zero, and we're actually interested in this process here uh, below the initial particle. But we can also go down to any generation, for example here, and we can restrict our attention to the process underneath this particle. And so there's going to be a tree there that started with a single particle. And that tree is going to give us a identical copy of the original process. Okay, so what you imagine is you have an initial particle gives rise to two particles, and then underneath those two particles are independent copies of the original process. Okay, and so just for um, for regularity purposes. For regularity purposes, we're going to assume a few things about the um, about the offspring distribution. We're going to assume, first of all, that the offspring distribution is non-degenerate, meaning it doesn't have a point mass at any given value. If it, if it were to have a point mass of 1 at any value, if it was a degenerate distribution, then there would be nothing interesting to say. Uh, we're also going to assume that the mean of the offspring distribution, uh, which is obvious from the first assumption, we assume that it's explicitly bigger than 0. Uh, if it was 0, then that would mean that the process dies out after 1 uh, value. So again, these are actually redundant statements, uh, but we're also going to assume that pk is bigger than zero for some k bigger than or equal to two. Okay. So if 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 that weren't the case, then what would happen is it just means that each uh, each particle either doesn't give birth uh, or gives birth to exactly one individual. Uh, in the next generation, and so what this process would look like would be just a sequence of zero, a sequence of ones, and then followed by a sequence of zeros, uh, an infinite sequence of zeros, and so it's just a geometric random variable, so it becomes uh, trivial. So the key, the key thing, the key technique that we're going to use to study this distribution using the recursive, so the recursive structure of the process is what's going to allow us to condition, as we usually do. Uh, on the first generation or the last generation. Um, and the multiplicative nature of the process is, is what makes the use of the generating function uh, particularly uh, useful um, in studying these processes because the generating function is giving, uh, so just to recall, the generating function I'm going to define the generating function phi n of t to be the expectation of t to the number of individuals y at a time at, at generation n. Okay. So this is going to be multiplicative uh, in the sum of the number of individuals that get, get produced in the next generation. Uh, and let me write phi specifically to be the generating function after one generation. And so the first thing that I want to observe here is that the if we let Zn be a Galton-Watson process with offspring distribution, PK 
and we have the generating function as we defined it above, then we can write Get rid of this thing. Then this allows us to write, first of all, we know that we start with one particle at time zero, so the generating function in this case is trivial, and we can actually get a recursive expression for the generating function at the n plus first generation can be expressed as the generating function phi evaluated at where we get a composition of the generating function, which is just the n plus one fold composition of the one step generating function. And this recursive structure is going to allow us to study certain things. We've seen earlier what this recursive structure can allow us to do using the fixed point theorem, um, the contraction mapping principle, and similar ideas where we have this iterated composition of a function. Um, under certain other monotonicity conditions, we can show that certain limits exist, and that's exactly what we're going to use this for um, in the... Uh, in a few of the theorems that come up. Um, but just to observe why this is the case is, you know, let's observe the construction of the process. So by construction, the way that the process evolves is we have some random number of individuals uh, at time, say, Zn. So we have some number of individuals Zn. And these are evolving into some number of individuals at time n plus 1. Let's see. So, this is n plus 1. And so this is just by the construction, the number of individuals alive at time n plus 1 is equal in distribution to some random number of, one way to do it is we can generate a, we can conditional, we can actually generate it one, one, one generation. So we first generate, so, okay, let me, uh, let me actually do it the other way first. So here what we've assumed is we actually have n individual, we have zn individuals alive at time at generation n, and then we want to know how many are alive at generation n plus 1. So in this case, this is just the expectation by definition of this quantity, which we can express as law of iterated expectation. Okay, now what is that law well, of iterated expectation? This is the expectation, this is the average over the value of Zn times the expectation, conditional expectation of Zn plus 1 given the value of Zn, okay, equal to k. If the if there are k individuals alive at the nth generation, then the generating function of the number of individuals alive at the n plus first generation, this is just a one generation, this is just the one generation value raised to the power k, right? This here is a, is just still the probability of the nth generation equal to k. And now this by definition, again this is k, this by definition is just the generating function of the nth generation and it's being evaluated at um, 
it's being evaluated at phi of t. So this is one, this is this is one statement. Alternatively, another way to do this is to observe that what we could could imagine doing is we start at one we start with one particle at time zero. We generate some random number of particles at time one, whatever it may be. And what we're interested in now is to is to realize that the number of particles alive at time at generation n plus one is going to be the sum of the number of particles alive in some generation n for each of these sublineages here. Okay, so that's the that's the equivalent. And so what we observe to prove this is that Gn plus one is equal in distribution to this random sum. Okay. And the Znj, uh, these are IID copies of Zn. And what that allows us to say then is by this distributional equivalence, by this distributional equivalence, the expectation of t to the zn plus 1, which is what we're interested in, is the expectation of t to this, this power here, this sum here. So this is a random sum, uh, which we can immediately see as the expectation of phi of n z1 times okay. and z1 times that is just the uh, this is clearly just the generating function of the first generation evaluated at the generating function for the nth generation okay. All right. so one of the so we're going to use this to study so one of the questions that we are interested in in studying this process are extinction probabilities so notice that in particular in this process unlike some unlike the processes we were studying in the last in in, in for the most part when we were thinking about markov chains we were thinking about chains that were um, a periodic that in the discrete time case, a periodic irreducible, meaning that they settle down to a stationary distribution. In in the Galton Watson process, there is a so there is an absorbing state in the process, which is that if we ever reach zero, um, so notice that if the chain ever if the process ever reaches zero for some n, then the chain is going to, then the process equals zero for all n greater than that value because there'll be nobody at gener at any generation past n to give birth to any new offspring. Okay. And so this is an absorbing state of the of the process. Okay. Another thing to realize, and this will come up later, is that Okay, so what we might, what we're interested in then is the the probability of go, of, of extinction. Um, so let's define the extinction time tau to be the first generation and 
at which there are zero offspring. So this is the time. This is the um, this is the extinction time, and we define uh, which we define to be infinite if Zn is strictly positive for all values. Okay. And what we're interested in, in then is the extinction probability which I'll write as zeta is the probability that this extinction time is finite. So the probability, the event that the chain goes extinct is exactly the event that tau is finite, right? It's exactly the event that the generation equals zero for some finite n, and that's going to be uh, correspond to the event that the chain is finite. Okay. Now, another observation is that in order for the chain to go extinct, or in order for the chain not to go extinct, in order for it to live forever, then we must only visit any given state, any given finite state, finitely often. Um, so another observation is that tau equals infinity if and only if Zn equals k finitely often for all finite k with probability one. And we don't we haven't yet proven this, but the, the intuition is well if there are whatever this extinction probability is, okay, if it's strictly less than one, then what is it what does it take for so what does it take for the chain to go extinct? Right? So if we have one particle at time at time one, then the probability of extinction is zeta. Okay. Now, if it happens that 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 particle gives birth to some random number of individuals at time uh, at, at generation one, then however many there are, the probability of extinction is going to be. Well, we need in order to go in order for the initial process to go extinct. Each one of these each each one of these um, z1 lineages all has to go extinct, and so now the probability of extinction is zeta to the power z1 because they're individual, they're independent lineages, and they all have the same probability of going extinct. So if zeta, if the process has a positive probability of going extinct. And if we visit a finite value, uh, a finite um, level of a, if we, every time we visit level k, so every time we have a generation of size k, there's a positive probability zeta to the power k that 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 that, that, that process from that point forward goes extinct. So it's a positive probability. If we visit that level infinitely often, then we will eventually go extinct. With probability one. But this relationship here is something that we want to take advantage of to get some handle on what these extinction probabilities actually are. Okay. So what we can do now is we can actually state what this must satisfy using this recursive relationship, uh, which we've already pretty much argued, which is that The extinction probability is the smallest root of phi t equals t. And so just visually what's going on here is in order for the process to go extinct at all, okay, we need some positive probability 
that a given particle has no offspring. If every particle has at least one offspring, then the probability of extinction is zero. And uh, how do we see that? Well, we're going to plot, first of all, the function uh, function t. As a function of t, we have the diagonal. Okay. We have the diagonal. And what we know is that at t equals 1, phi, phi of t equals 1. Phi of 1 equals 1, okay, because it's a, just by definition, phi of t equals the expectation of t to the z1. We put 1 in for t, it's equal to 1. Okay. And phi of 0 is the is so this is t to the power of z1 so phi of 0 is going to be the probability that the uh, first generation is of size 1 or size 0 and so if the first generation is of size 0 we started with one particle uh, and so that would be extinct so then the pro then the um, the chain would be extinct in one step so let's let this be p0. Okay. And so what happens is if we plot, if we were to plot phi of t, if we were to plot the generating function, make sure this, so this is the line, this is just the diagonal line t equals zero, t equals t, then it could look something like this. So it's always going to hit this point here but it might go through it here, or it actually might not. It might kind of stay above it until it hits up here. Okay. And what this theorem says is that the probability of extinction is the smallest root of this, so it's the first point at which the chain, uh, at which the uh, function passes through this line. So in order to prove this, we want a condition. So we already kind of gave the argument for where this relationship comes from, because we already showed, we already gave some argument for if we condition on the first step, then the probability of extinction becomes this expression here. So we condition on the first step, condition on the size of the first generation. And what do we get? So what we're interested in is we're interested in the probability of going extinct. So what's the probability of extinction given the size of the first generation? Probability of extinction given the first generation is the probability of extinction in each of the lineages, and they're all independent. So we've already seen this. And so this gives us formally what we had already argued by conditioning on the size of the first generation. what we get is exactly the relationship that we were looking for. All right, so we've shown that the probability that we're looking for, the extinction probability, is a fixed point of the generating function. So it satisfies the relationship, but it, we, we still need to show that it's the smallest solution to this, to this equation in general. Um, Remember what phi is, phi is a generating function uh, right here. And so, what's going on here? Come on. Phi is a generating function, 
um, and it's a polynomial, so it's going to have multiple solutions in general, and we need to show that it's the smallest solution. So um, notice that in general we can define a sequence. zeta n to be the probability that the nth generation is extinct and realizing that if the nth generation is extinct then that's well then it's ex well if, if there's nobody in the nth generation then the uh, population is going extinct because there'd be nobody to produce offspring in any future generations so um, by this observation of course, zeta zero um, should just be zero uh, because we start with one individual. But this is a strictly this is a monotone, non-decreasing um, sequence. It's also bounded. So it's bounded above by one. Uh, so it does converge, but uh, we can observe the relationship that the probability of, st of extinction, using the same argument, probability of extinction in the n plus first generation is equal to, we can average, right, this is the probability of having zero offspring, so probability of extinction in the n plus first generation given k individuals in the first generation which is just zeta n to the k because it's k generate it's now n generations into the future and there's k individuals and so this is phi of zeta n so we have a sequence that is evolving, so this sequence can be expressed as an iterative composition of the generating function evaluated at the place before it. And also phi is an increasing function. I don't know about this, this is scary, it's listening to me. Get this out of here. Alright. Alright, so phi and we note that also that phi is an increasing function. We know that because phi has all positive um, coefficients. Um, and so what this tells us is that we know that we have a monotone bounded function so it converges to some limit. And that limit is exactly the probability that we want, the extinction probability, um, as n goes to infinity. So that's what we want to show, that this limit is the smallest solution. So let's let psi be the smallest solution. So phi psi equals phi. Okay. And what we already know is that this relationship holds. Uh, no, it's not right. Here. Okay. This relationship holds for zeta zero but it also holds for arbitrary n so that all the way down the limit of this the limit that we're interested in is no larger than the smallest root but of course we know that zeta is a root and so zeta has to be the smallest root.
Now, um, one thing that we want to um, we want to consider is okay. What is the so what we've just showed is that the extinction probably is the smallest root, and what we we can show one further thing about which is a bit of a structural property about what the um, what the generating function looks like. Uh, so what we'll end up showing is that we know that the extinction probability is the root of this equation and we've, we've highlighted two uh, potential paths, although there may be others, but uh, in this picture there's a path where it goes through at a value strictly less than one and there's the case where it actually doesn't cross until one, meaning as a, a an extinction probability of one. So there are there are processes that have less than uh, an extinction probability less than one, meaning there's a chance that they live live on forever. Okay, and so this is the now intuitively what would we expect that to be? Well, if the mean of the offspring distribution means anything then we would expect that at the mean bigger than one, then what we're experiencing, the population's experiencing growth on average. So on average, the, the population, let's say the mean were two. So then in the first generation, there's one individual. On average, there's two individuals in the second generation, four, eight, 16, and so on. And so on average, we're experiencing uh, multiplicative growth in the population with each generation, although of course there's a chance that in the first generation the first individual has no offspring and then it goes extinct. So there's a positive probability of extinction, but it doesn't have to be one. Um, on the other hand, if we were experiencing decay, so if, if the expected number of individuals was only a half, if there were less than one, if the replacement rate was less than one, then we have one individual in the first generation, half in the second, quarter in the third, and so on. And so what happens there is that um, we're going to go extinct with probability one. Uh, and there's a number of ways to understand this, but basically we have a constant force pulling us down to visit every finite, every finite level infinitely often. And so eventually once, you're, once you have enough chances to hit to go extinct, you're going to go extinct. Now the question then is also what the what happens in the case where the mean is exactly equal to one. Um, so first of all, let me just write the definition. So we call the process um, so this is this is this process, this definition can be said for for any um, pretty much any branching process. Uh, and other types of processes as well, but we're going to call it supercritical. If the mean of the offspring distribution is bigger than one, this is where the mu is the mean of the offspring distribution, we call it subcritical if the mean is less than one and we call it critical if the mean is equal to one. So we've already talked about the supercritical and critical cases in the crit uh, supercritical and subcritical cases in the critical situation the expected number of individuals we have one start in the first generation we have an expected number of offspring of one so there's one in the second generation, one in the third generation, one in the fourth generation on average and so you can imagine, well, what's the probability of extinction in this case? It should be one because, well, if there's a problem, assuming that it's a non-trivial process, assuming that there's any probability that an individual has zero offspring, since on, in any given generation we expect to have exactly one individual in that generation, then there's a probability. We have infinitely many chances to go extinct, and we will with probability one. So if you remember um, back to the gambler's ruin problem, there is some connection here in the sense that we saw that if you play uh, Gambler's Ruin um, and we're playing a game where I win a dollar or I lose a dollar 
um, each with probability p. And we consider the chance that I either lose some finite amount of money or I go off and become infinitely rich. So I escape to infinity without ever passing, without ever exhausting my bankroll. What we saw is that if the probability of winning P was bigger than a half, there was a chance, there was a positive probability chance that we go off to infinity, although it's not equal to one. There's always a chance that we could go broke before we get there. Um, if the probability P was less than a half, then with probability one, we will go broke before we escape. And if the probability P was equal to a half, that was the critical case um, in, this, in, this, in this terminology, but we see also that we will go broke with probability one because what we know in the simple random walk is that we will revisit our initial bankroll infinitely often, and every time we visit our initial bankroll, there's a chance that we're going hit, to um, hit the lower bound. Okay, so there is a connection there. Um, but the, just to fill in that intuition, um, with a proposition here is let's assume that the distribution, the offspring distribution is not a point mass so it doesn't assign probability it's not a point mass at k equals 1 so it doesn't assign probability 1 to 1 um, because in that case, it's just a trivial process that stays at one for all value. Um, then the equation, the fixed point equation that we need to solve has one or two roots in the unit interval. And in the supercritical case, There's a unique root at some t strictly less than 1. And in the critical or subcritical cases, the root is at t equals 1. Okay, so there's only one root in that interval. And it's um, at t equals 1. Okay. And the way to uh, argue this is I'm just going to prove this with visually. Um, intuitively, it's, it's clear what, what to do, but the, the arguments in the notes um, is that you can break this up into cases. Um, first of all, let's do the easy case. Uh, so the picture here is what phi looks like, and this is the, so this is t, this is phi of t, this is 1, okay, and this is the diagonal, so this is where the fixed point happens. And the first case is very simple, which is just that p0 equals 0 and mu is bigger than 1. Okay, if p0 equals 0, that means that there is zero probability that any generation, that anyone has zero offspring. And so, of course, uh, in this case, we know that the probability of extinction is 0, and we also know that the value phi of 0 equals 0, so there is a fixed point right here, and so that's the unique fixed point less than 1, and um, we're done. Okay, so that's the easy case. Um, the a little bit more interesting case would be the cases where, uh, let's see, let's start with the mean, which is the derivative, so the key idea is that it's the derivative evaluated at 1, and if this if this is strictly less than or, if this is less than or equal to one, then what happens? Well, what we know is that phi is a convex, so phi is strictly convex. Okay, so observe that 
phi is strictly convex. It's increasing. And it also has an increasing uh, derivative. So what happens is the derivative at 1, which is here, if it's less than 1, that means that it must be above the line. So we start, say, somewhere here. And it has to be above the line the whole way. Um, and this is an argument using the uh, mean value theorem because we know that phi of 1, so just notice that phi of 1 is always equal to 1 and phi prime of 1 is equal to the mean. Okay. So we know that we have to pass through here and the, the mean value theorem is, what's, is, is what tells us that if there were some point uh, down here, say, that we went through, then we have to eventually turn around. So we would have to turn around and come up, which is going to violate the, uh, which is going to violate that the, um, the derivative, which is going to violate the assumption that the derivative is less than one. Okay. Um, so. So just visually, we can see that the art, we can see that this function um, can only pass through this point here, uh, because otherwise, if we did pass this, we know we have to turn around because there's going to have to be a point by the mean value theorem where these uh, the derivatives are in parallel. The derivative of this is one, um, but that can't happen. Okay. So. We know that that can't happen because of the structural properties of the um, of the uh, of the function. Okay, so mean value theorem. Suppose zeta was strictly less than one, then there would exist a theta between. zeta and 1 such that so there would be a a point at which the a point theta in between zeta and 1 at which the derivative is equal to 1 but this is a contradiction and then similarly by a similar kind of, of logic what if the mean of the distribution is greater than one. Okay. Well, if the mean is greater than one, then we could, in principle, we could expand. Um, so think about expanding phi in a Taylor uh, polynomial near one. But really, what's going to happen is that if we were to start here, we know that the derivative at 1 has to be going up. Um, and so there's going to be some, uh, there's going to be some need, since we know that by assumption here, phi of 0 is strictly bigger than 0. So we've started here, and we're ending up here. Um, and so but the intermediate value theorem intermediate value theorem is going to force a t star strictly between 0 and 1 um, <coughs> such that phi t star minus t star equals 0 and that's going to be <coughs> the unique point zeta that we're looking for. Okay. So that's a sketch of the proof and the rest of the argument, specifics of the argument can be found in the notes. Okay, so we'll stop here for this lecture. We're going to come back next time. We'll talk more about the uh, expected, the extinction time distribution and other branching processes.